The Christadelphians present This is Your Bible, a program dedicated to the study of your Bible to learn about the wonderful future that God has planned for this earth. Join us now as we open up the Bible and reason together around God's Word. And what I'm going to talk to you about is a simple Bible study on the subject of immortality. I'll try to talk slowly so that you can take notes, and many of the key references will be put on the screen. I encourage you to note them down and look at them later. If we turn to our Bibles, we can start first with the words of Jesus Christ in the book of John, the Gospel of John. And the passage here that I'm referring to is in the third chapter of John, in the 13th verse. Jesus makes a very definitive statement. He says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Now that is a very clear reference. There can be no doubt as to what Jesus is saying. Put very simply and very directly, no man had ascended up to heaven. Now at first glance, that seems quite strange. In the view of much common teaching, Jesus' words seem almost completely wrong. But we know that that can not be right because the Lord Jesus Christ obviously knew what he was talking about. So I think the best thing to do is to see what other scriptures have to bear on these comments of Jesus Christ. Let's turn to the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, the second chapter. Now the second chapter of Acts records what I would call a public lecture. In this case, the apostle Peter only a few days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, was speaking to a large audience in Jerusalem. And at that time, he told them about the hope that he and the other apostles had. And during the course of that lecture, he makes some of the following comments. And it's in Acts, the second chapter, verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Now David's sepulcher, or tomb, was just outside the walls of Jerusalem. And it's quite possible, as Peter was making these comments, that he could point right across the valley to that tomb, so that all in his audience could see the visible presence of the grave of David and of his body. Later on in the same lecture, in Acts, the second chapter, verse 34, Peter says, For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Now you can see that Peter's teaching here was quite, quite in line with what Jesus Christ said in the Gospel of John. David had not ascended into heaven. And Jesus Christ said, no man hath ascended into heaven. Now David was the greatest king that Israel ever had. He had lived almost a thousand years before these words of Peter. He is called in the scriptures, God's beloved. And yet, the scriptures record that his tomb was still there, his body was still there, and he had not ascended into heaven. These are the words of the Apostle Peter. Well, let's take a little further look at this. We're not going to obviously be convincing with one or two quotes. It involves some detailed Bible study, but the nature of it is quite simple because the Bible verses involved repeat this message over and over again. Now, since Peter speaks of the prophet David, King David, let's look at some of David's own words. And we can turn back to the Old Testament, to the 115th Psalm. And in the 115th Psalm, we get a chance to learn a little about what David t thought of the nature of immortality. Now, 115th Psalm. It's in verse 16 and 17. Now, in this 115th Psalm, David says, The heaven... Even the heavens are the Lord's, 
but the earth hath he given to the children of men. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. The earth is reserved for the children of men, for us. The heavens are the Lord's. Again, we see that this is a very consistent verse, completely in line with what Peter said on the day of Pentecost, and absolutely in line with what Jesus Christ said in the Gospel of John. The earth is the place in which the Lord God is working out His plan of salvation. It is this place, the place that we're on right now, that we've walked on and breathed, that God has prepared for the future. And this makes, of course, perfect sense. God has given us a glimpse of where He will reside with us and where He will fulfill all the promises He has made. The common images, sometimes you see it even in cartoons and, and in, in common newspaper stories and, and common mythology, does not appear to be what either Peter or Jesus or David are talking about. Let's go a little further. Let's go back in Psalms to the 49th Psalm and hear again the words of David, uh, which were referred to earlier. Uh, it's in the 49th Psalm, and th this Psalm is such an excellent Psalm that it really should be read in its entirety, but time will not allow us to do it now. But if you get a chance, read all of the, of the 49th Psalm. I'm going to start down at verse 10. He says, For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses will continue forever, and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beast that perish. These words were written 3,000 years ago. And how interesting that the observation made by David is the same one that occurs today. They call their lands after their own names. It was the common practice of kings of old to build cities and name those cities after themselves. Uh, we have some of the same thing going on today, but we've run out of place names for many cities, so we name a lot of streets and public parks after departed people to perpetuate their memory. And thus, if you drive around any great city in, in this country or in other countries of the world, you'll see many streets and many parks and many other public uh, places named after great and famous men of old. Many of these we're familiar with, and we know that these people have passed and only the memory of their name continues. It is not immortality that is given through such naming. Immortality is not at all what can be acquired apart from the Lord God. And so it is in vanity in a sense, and this is what David says, it is vanity to think that your memory will be perpetuated simply because you name something after yourselves. He says that their inward thought is that they will continue, but the reality is, nevertheless, verse 12 of Psalm 49, man being an honor abideth not. He is like the beast that perish. Later on in the same Psalm, verse 14, he says, like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Verse 17, For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. And finally, in verse 20 of this same psalm, he says, Man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beast that perish. Now that's very important to understand because I don't think anyone would claim that an animal has an immortal soul. I never heard of an immortal pussycat or an immortal rat or an immortal dog. Immortality is not ever spoken of by anyone in those terms. And yet there are people who think that man has some special preeminence over the beasts in this regard. But the Bible says quite the opposite. 
it says man that is in honor and understand that not is exactly like the beast that perish. There can be no doubt as to what is meant. Man that is in honor and understandeth not. In other words, you can be one of the most honorable people in the world. You could be the President of the United States or the King of England or the Queen of England, I guess. But if you don't understand the things of God, then you have no relationship with God and you are no better than the beasts in God's sight and you will be laid in the grave exactly like the sheep. Now that's what David says in Psalm 49 and I really do urge you to look at those words very carefully. Now let's go on to some other passages. Later, David's son Solomon wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes some very interesting passages concerning the same subject, the nature of immortality. And it's in Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter. Verse 4. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Now that's a quite an interesting metaphor, but what the, the, the man Solomon, the King Solomon is saying is that while you're alive, you have a chance to do something about serving God and about understanding and approaching the things of God so that you might have an opportunity for immortality. Once you're dead, no matter how powerful you are, if you were a lion, as it were, in the Lord's sight, you would not receive any hope of immortality. He goes on in this chapter, this ninth chapter of Ecclesiastes, he says, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Again, this aims very clearly at the teaching that once we are dead, there is no longer any opportunity to serve God or to do anything whatsoever about our fate. Our fate for the future is decided here and now, in this life, while we are yet alive. Now is the time to serve the Lord. Once we are dead, all memory of us will be forgotten. He goes on to say in verse 6 of Ecclesiastes 9, also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepted thy works. In other words, once we are dead, that God has accepted what we've done in our lifetime. And it's what we have done in our lifetime on which we will be judged. In the grave, we are unconscious. And any opportunity to change what we have done in our lifetimes has ended. Verse 8 of this Ecclesiastes 9, he says, Let thy garments be always white, which means pure, and let thy head lack no ointment. Live joyfully with the wife of whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity. For this is thy portion in this thy life and in thy labor which thou hast taken under the sun. And finally, in verse 10 of this same chapter, he makes a very dramatic conclusion to the thought. He says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Now that is a very stunning reference, but you can see it's completely in line with what the prophet David taught in the 49th Psalm. It's completely in line with what Peter taught taught on the day of Pentecost, and it's completely in line with the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we started out this entire lesson with, where we showed that Jesus said, no man hath ascended into heaven. Now Solomon says that in the grave there is no work, device, knowledge, wisdom, or memory. 
And I think that the only thing that we can conclude from all of these verses is that once we are dead, we lie unconscious, period. Well, then you might ask me, well, what about immortality? What hope do we have? If I don't have any hope in the grave, maybe something else in me lives on. Well, the Greeks taught, and actually it was Plato, taught that the personality of a person did not perish with their death. And he gave it the name soul. The body perished, but some small essence of us was supposed to ascend up to the Olympiad heights or to Hades if we were not worthy of being in the Olympian heights. And this doctrine of Plato's, which came about five centuries before Jesus Christ, eventually permeated all of Western thinking. It is not something that appears in the Bible, even though many people think it does. Later, there was a man called Lucretius, who lived about the same time as Julius Caesar, about 50 years before Jesus Christ. He didn't believe the teachings of Plato, and he decided to find out if the body really did con contain some mysterious essence that departed it on death. And so he did a rather crazy experiment. He weighed someone before and after they died. And you can imagine this was not an easy experiment to do, but he was very determined to see precisely if there was anything else in the body other than the conscious matter. And of course, he found no weight difference whatsoever. These two schools of thought persisted forever since that time. But Plato's teaching has pretty much dominated the West until many people believe that at death, something leaves the body and goes on to heaven or hell. Now that's not really very consistent with the teaching that we've already seen, but there's even more direct evidence in the scripture that this is not possible. If we look at the words of the prophet Ezekiel, we see that he says very directly, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And that teaching is in Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, at verses 4 and 20. Verses 4 and 20 of Ezekiel 18. The soul that sinneth, it shall die, or perish. In fact, in the Bible, the word soul is used interchangeably with the word for creature, or person, or being. And there is no indication whatsoever about the soul being immortal. You might note that in scriptures, the term immortal soul never appears, not even once, not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. In fact, if you have a Bible concordance, look up the word immortality and you'll find that it appears only five times. And every one of those appearances is concerned either with the Lord God or with what Jesus Christ has done. Not a single reference applies to us. Let's take a look at a few of these so we can have some standard of comparison because it's only five verses, and if we can get through a few of them, I'll cite the others and you get a chance to see quite directly what the scriptures is teaching about this. The first one is in the letter of Timothy in the New Testament, uh, the epistle of, of Paul, when he wrote this letter to Timothy, it's in the sixth chapter of Timothy at verse 16. And in this case, the word immortality refers to the Lord God. It says, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So we, this is the first place where the word immortality appears, and it clearly refers to the Lord God. It has no reference to us whatsoever. Another reference to this word appears in the earlier part of Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16. Again, the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, 
Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter hereafter believe on him to life everlasting, now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. This verse clearly refers to the Lord God and makes no reference to us whatsoever. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, we find the third place where this term immortal or immortality appears in Scripture. Verse 10 of 2 Timothy, the first chapter. But now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. What was made manifest? Manifest means to reveal. What had God revealed through Jesus Christ? Who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So the reference here to immortality refers to the work of Jesus Christ. He made immortality possible through his work. Prior to that time, it had not been brought to light. There are two references left in which the word appears in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, chapter, verse 53. At that passage, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So it is evident that immortality is something we must acquire. We have to put it on. It is not something we presently have. He speaks of us in the present state as being corruptible. In other words, we are completely decaying. There is nothing in us now that speaks of immortality. And you can see that this teaching is completely in line with what we read previously of the Apostle Peter, of Jesus Christ, of David and Solomon. So many of these great worthies of old all testify to the same exact doctrinal principle. There's one last verse that speaks of immortality, and it's in Romans, the second chapter. This is the last place of the five that I've cited where the word appears in Scripture. There are no other references to it. Second chapter of Romans, verse 7. Here he says, To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor, immortality and eternal life. So he says that it is something we must seek. It is not something we presently have. Well, how are we going to seek it? How is immortality to come about? There is really many, many references to it. There are over 40 references in the scripture to the resurrection of the body. There are more than 100 references to the acquiring of an inheritance at a future time right here on earth. Let's turn up a few of those. Uh, the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament gives a particularly, a particularly powerful one. Uh, there can be very little doubt about what Isaiah had in mind when he was speaking in the 26th chapter of his book. It's in chapter 26 of Isaiah, verse 19. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise, awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. And so the prophet Ezekiel also testifies of this, and the prophet Jeremiah testifies of this. In fact, from Daniel onward, all the minor prophets testify of this. Jesus Christ testifies of it. The resurrection of the dead is spoken of over and over and over again in scriptures. The passage here in Isaiah is a particularly interesting one, and I urge you to look it up. 26th chapter, 19th verse. Go to the New Testament and look at um, the words of Paul to the Galatians. He gives a clue as to how this eternal life will be accomplished. It is part of the promises that God made long ago to a man called Abraham. It's in the eighth verse of chapter 3 of Galatians. 
He says, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. All nations were to be blessed through the promises God made to Abraham more than 4,000 years ago. Now, Abraham is dead and buried. He has not ascended into heaven. We see that from many, many verses that we cited previously in this program. The only way that Abraham can receive these promises and for all nations to be blessed is by it occurring on earth at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let's go to Acts, the 17th chapter, and see how Paul says this will be accomplished. It's in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. Speaking of how man have ignored God for ages and ages, Paul says at the 30th verse of chapter 17, For the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent, because he had appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that man whom he hath ordained. And that man is Jesus Christ. Friends, this is what we look forward to, the day when Jesus Christ will come again and resurrect the dead and fulfill the inheritance that he has promised. For pamphlets and articles on this subject and other Bible subjects, go to www.thisisyourbible.com, click on the Library tab, and select from Basic Bible Teaching, Bible Study, Doctrine, Life, Prophecy, The Christadelphians. In addition to our library, thisisyourbible.com offers online Bible study courses and Bible answers to your questions. Select www.thisisyourbible.com to increase your understanding of God's Word and learn about His future kingdom on the earth.